Let, let's open our Bibles to uh, the book of Revelation, because I believe as you turn there that, that the most piercing Christmas message we could ever receive would be from the Christ of Christmas who comes back to see what his church is doing with what he left them to do, especially at Christmas time. Are we going to follow the culture of our world and focus primarily on stuff? You know, that's, the world is focused on stuff. And Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is not remote and distant. He has actually come back in Revelation 2 and 3 for an, a visit to his church. And the message he gives to the church in Laodicea is a perfect message for us in the 21st century. Because the parallels between Laodicea century one in their absolute wealth, this is the only church that, that had so much money, they were piling up stuff, is so parallel to the 21st century in which we live. Jesus gives a message that is so timely to Christmas, so relevant to our choices this season, so right where we are, it's uncanny. Basically, what Jesus addresses the church at Laodicea with is that you are so loaded with stuff that it's like cataracts on your spiritual eyes. Your things have increased so much that they've blinded you to who you are and it's my church, to why I left you here, to what you're to be doing. Jesus said that there's a danger of having too much stuff. They had, through their careful earnings and buyings and in the process, they, they, in their storing and in their using of all that stuff, they didn't know the danger. I was reading an article this morning in the New York Times about the the Japanese gypsies, that caught my attention. I didn't know there were gypsies in Japan. But it's a group of Japanese people that are finding ways to go through the radiation zone barriers where the reactor radiation spewed out. And they're going back in just for five minutes to get stuff out of homes that, that people abandoned because of the radiation and the danger. And the high radiation, even in, in short little incremental exposures, begins to shrivel the, the marrow of the bones. And it says there, there, there's this whole group that they call Japanese gypsies that they go in for a half hour and they come out and they go in a week later for an hour and they come out. And it says what they're doing is getting such a high dosage that though they look apparently healthy, it says that, that they're dying from the center of their bones onward. What Jesus said is this church, though it looked healthy, were shriveled up because of the danger of too much stuff. We've all witnessed two amazing global events the past week. Remember, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, actually on Thanksgiving Day, after the meal, it started and America regained the unbroken succession of being the world's greatest consumer and purchaser of stuff. Because the day after Thanksgiving exceeded all records in history and America bought more things on Black Friday than has ever been purchased before. Now there was some doubt, they thought maybe we would equal last year, but we passed it. Three days later, the second global event that the whole world witnessed, Americans sitting at their computers purchased more stuff in one single day than has ever been purchased online in the history of the world. America, America is following this, this idea of, of consumption that, that just characterizes, in fact, the only way to get our economy going is to get the American consumption going again, because it drives the engine. And as we live in that radiation zone of materialism is what we live in, the exposures to that are deadly. And that's what Jesus is talking about. In verse 17 of Revelation 3, it's the heart of our study. And Jesus speaks in verse 17, 2,000 years ago, in Revelation 3, 17, but it's, it's just as uncannily for us clear. And what I'm going to do is there are five major versions represented here this morning in your Bible translations. I'm going to read what each of the five says because one of the five, they all say the same thing, but one of them most captures what the Greek word is 
in that second phrase. So Revelation 3.17, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. You follow along in your Bible, and this is what Jesus says in verse 17, because you say, I am rich. Now all the versions say that. The second phrase is what I want to share with you this morning and examine. Uh, the New King James says, and, or it says, have become wealthy. And the New American says, and have become wealthy. And the NIV says, I have acquired wealth. The English Standard says, I have prospered. But the oldest of the five is closest to actually the Greek word. And it says, because you say I am rich, and here's what the King James says, and increased with goods. That word that stands behind the English translation speaks of the ancient world that you knew someone's wealth because they had, it, it, there wasn't digital wealth back then. If you had it, it was there. And you had barns and houses and servants and lands and gold and, and stuff. And he says, you guys are, are stacking, piling stuff around you in Laodicea. And look at the rest of it. And have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Let's bow together. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, with your word open before us, with hearing that word in our ears, that we would hear with our hearts, that we would hear a message, that we wouldn't deflect the message. We wouldn't think it's for some other uh, person or some other group or some other time. We are in the danger zone. We are exposed to one of the deadliest of all temptations, the covetousness of materialism, the, the longing and pursuit with our lives for more stuff. And Lord, I pray that in any way we need to be stirred and convicted by your word that, that we would have ears to hear this morning and open our eyes to the truth of what response you want from us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, Christ's warnings are not new. What Jesus said here to this church 2,000 years ago is what he preached during his earthly ministry, but it's also what the content was of the Old Testament prophets. And I want you to think about that this morning because what we find from the Old Testament's wisest man, in fact, I'd like you to turn there with me, to Ecclesiastes. If we were having a Bible drill, you would open your Bible right to the middle and find Psalms. And as soon as you find the book of Psalms, go to the right of the book of Psalms, and you go through Proverbs, and there's 31 chapters, and then you go to Ecclesiastes, and we want the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes. So Psalms, to the right, Proverbs, and then five chapters into Ecclesiastes. Because... The Old Testament's wisest man warns about the dangers. In fact, he gives eight dangers of having too much stuff. Basically, God has spoken often and very clearly about why the more we have, the more dangerous our lives become. And most of us think as we read these verses that obviously it's talking about someone else. It's talking about, you know, the Ford family or the Warren Buffetts of this world or those, you know, Ellison of Oracle or, you know, I mean, whoever the rich uh, and famous are of the world, but not us. Most people kind of mirror what John D. Rockefeller said, you know, the, the world's first billionaire. When someone said, uh, uh, you know, what do you think of your wealth? He says, all I want is just one more dollar. Just one more. Just one more. See, that insatiable one more. And that's materialism. Materialism is an insatiable desire for just a little more. Or maybe a lot more, but more. Never content. And most of us, if we listen to Solomon, the man with the most stuff in the Bible, can hear what he's saying. Because now he's not, he's not theorizing. This man had more stuff than anybody else. The Bible says that, that when he lived, that silver, sterling silver, was, was treated like rocks in the garden. Just leave them in the garden. They're pretty, but they're just rocks. Gold was all he used. Gold was all he touched. Everything was made of gold for him. That's, that's the ultimate expression of having stuff. The, the top. And starting in verse 10, look at chapter 5, verse 10, we have some very clear warnings. And instead of thinking they're pointing elsewhere, ask the Lord. Just say, Lord, is there anything you want me to see in your word this morning? Is there anything you want me to change in my life? 
That, that's how we come before the Word of God. Starting in verse 10, and I'm going to read the whole passage and, uh, from 10 down to 15. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. Verse 11, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. Verse 13, there is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches kept for their owners to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there's nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. You know, after first service, uh, someone met me in the lobby and they says, you know what I do? I'm, I'm a, I forget what, they're somehow attached to reporting on auctions. And they said they know all the auctioneers in the area. And it said that, that many of those auctioneers just don't like stuff anymore because they've seen too much of it hoarded in all these estate sales. And the person told me about one they recently did. They had 10, one elderly woman had 10,000 pieces of costume jewelry. Wonder if she wore them all, you know? Do you ever think about how hard it is when once we get collecting stuff to stop? It's, it's hard to know. But look at these lessons. Lesson number one. It's in verse 10. Here's the lesson. The more stuff we accumulate, the more stuff we want. There's, there's this proportion. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. In other words, whatever we have a lot of, we always want more of it. If we have a lot, we want more. That's just what Solomon found. Second lesson is in verse 10. The more stuff we hold on to, the less satisfied we become. He who loves abundance with increase. See, see, it says, if you love silver, you don't like enough silver. If you love abundance, you won't even be satisfied when your abundance increases. So there's this decreasing. The more we hold on to it, the less satisfied we become. Look at verse 11. The more stuff we own, the more stuff everyone tries to get away from us. You ever notice that? The more wealth you have, everybody wants it. Well, what he says in verse 11 is, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. I mean, the government wants a bigger share. The relatives... The, everybody wants more. The more stuff we own, the more stuff everyone tries to get from us. Look at the end of verse 11. Uh, the principal lesson here is the more stuff we pile up, the less of it we really can use. The more different things we have, the less we can use them. What he says is what profit is to the owner at the end of verse 11 except to see them with their eyes. And they have so many choices, so many cars, so many, you know, whatevers. They can't use them all. So what good is it? You just see them. You can't use them. Verse 12, the fifth lesson, the more stuff we build up, the more we worry about our stuff. The more stuff we have, the more we have to worry about. What he says is, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. Two different thoughts. The rich eat too fancy a food, but another very true uh, principle here is, the more stuff you have, the more you wonder whether it's okay, whether, you know, someone is breaking into that whatever, that, that auxiliary place that stores all the stuff. The sixth one is in verse 13. And the more stuff we hold on to tightly, the more we get injured because we're holding so tightly to it. And what he says is there's a severe evil on, which I've seen under the sun, verse 13, riches kept for their owner to his hurt. You know, one of the biggest hurts I see is that, that some people, it becomes clear to the people around them, their friends and their family, that their stuff is more important than the friends or family. It's like the goal in life is to hold on to it as long as possible. And that's hurtful. The 14th verse has the, the first phrase of it has this lesson, the more stuff we keep, the more stuff we can lose. In other words, the more you have, the more you can lose. The bigger your pile, the bigger the loss. What he says is, but those riches perish through misfortune. The riches that are kept, they can be lost because the Lord says anything that we keep, we lose, but whatever we, whatever we give back to him, we never lose. And what he's talking about here is the stuff that was held onto. And here's the last one. Look at the, the last phrase of verse 14 and 15. It talks about 
the more we have, the more we leave behind because you don't, didn't bring anything in the world and you can't take anything out. That, that's what it says. When he begets a son, the end of verse 14, there's nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. He shall take nothing from his labor which he may carry away in his hand. In other words, no one can take anything with them to heaven. No stuff goes to heaven. No stuff goes into eternity. We can take people with us that we lead to Christ before we die. We can send things ahead by giving them to Christ. But we can't take anything out of this world. And so the goal is to divest the ownership. The idea is not to have nothing, but to own nothing. To have it all owned by another. To be under his control. And, and so that he bears the stress of the care of it. And he can and we shouldn't. When Jesus was speaking to this wealthiest church, and, and let's turn now to the book of Matthew, because on the way to Revelation, I want to show you that this was not new, what Jesus said, because Jesus constantly exposed the dangers of wealth. When Jesus spoke to the wealthiest church in Revelation 2 and 3, he was speaking the same truths that he shared in the Gospels. In Revelation 3, Christ implied their wealth is what was holding them back. They knew they were wealthy. They said, because you say, it's a self-confessed malady, because you say, well, Jesus spoke much about money and wealth and possessions during his earthly ministry. In fact, you know that the Gospels, the New Testament, has the first four books of the Gospels. There's 89 chapters in the Gospels. There are 2,880 verses in the four Gospels. Jesus speaks one out of every seven verses recorded from his mouth. One out of seven, that's 15%, 14 point something percent, of all of Christ's recorded words are about the dangers of wealth. The dangers of misused wealth. To whom much is given, what does the Bible say? Much will be what? Required. The, the goal of life is not to see how much stuff I can control, but how much stuff the Lord blesses me with that I can return to his control. Let's see what Jesus said, starting in Matthew chapter 6. I want to just share a few of his clear commands. I'm just, it's every seventh word he spoke, so we're not going to read the whole gospel. Let me just pull out some of the really piercing ones. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. He's talking about the conflict we go through in life until we surrender. That, that, we, that the goal of our life is not to be measured materially, even though everybody in our culture around us does. And, and, and we, we admire the rich and the famous, and we look down on the poor and unsuccessful. And that's just how it is. And we think God blesses the rich, and there's something wrong with you. Why are you poor? And that's, that's just, that's a tension. The Lord says you, you can't serve God and mammon. You, you, have to, you have to surrender the control of stuff to me. Uh, look at verse 28, same chapter. Uh, why do you worry about clothes? Matthew 6, 28. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't labor or spin. I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of those. If, if God, if that is how God so clothes the grass of the field that's here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you have little faith. See, riches rob us of faith. What do you need faith for when you have sight? Uh, how can you trust the Lord to take care of you to the end when, when you've already calculated how much you need and, and you've got to build the pile up big enough? Now, it isn't saying that we're supposed to get rid of everything. If we don't have food and raiment, the Lord says we shouldn't be content. We, we should be seeking to have food and raiment. Also, he said, if you don't provide for those that are under your care, you're worse than an unbeliever. But we're talking about a lot more than provision. We're talking about a lack of faith that I've got to take care of myself to the very end. I can't trust the Lord. And I'm going to trust, you know, the corporate pension, at least until a few years ago, and then that's all shaken. And what the Bible says, don't trust in uncertain riches. That's the bottom line, 1 Timothy 6. Well, look at chapter 13, because this gets worse. Jesus, um, in Matthew 13, really rocked the boat for his day and his congregation listening to him. He's, he's explaining uh, in the parables, remember, almost half of Christ's parables are about the dangers of money. He, he gave 38 parables. This is one of them in chapter 13, verse 22. And, and he talks about riches in, in almost half of them. And this is what he says in verse 22. Now, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word 
and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Now, the word, the truth of God, is throttled and choked by the cares of this world. If, if all our minds are on are the, care, the cares of this world, we don't have time to focus on listening to God and applying his truth. And, and if we are pursuing riches, they're so deceitful that while they're giving us whatever benefit they give us, they're choking the word of God in our life. So Jesus said that, and that just shocked the people, uh, that, that it chokes the word and he becomes unfruitful, not bearing the fruit that Christ desired. This is so important. Those same words are also recorded in Mark 4 and Luke 8. Jesus is recorded saying it in all three of the synoptic gospels. Now, look at chapter 19. This is when, the, I mean, you heard a collective gasp in the audience because everyone in Christ's day thought, I mean, because of, of the Jewish heritage, they thought that the sign of blessing was wealth. The sign of the absence of blessing was poverty. And Jesus said, no, no. The poor receive me gladly. They're rich in faith. They're, they're the ones that are rich, not you with all the possessions. And so listen to how he says it in Matthew 19, verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And by the way, these words are so so important, they're recorded also in Mark 10 and Luke 18. I mean, these, these money stories show up in all of the synoptic accounts. Now you say, what is this camel through the eye of a needle thing? A camel was the largest known land animal that lived around them, and the needle was the smallest humanly made, the eye of a needle, the smallest thing that they could make. And so what Jesus was saying is, it's impossible. You can't string a camel through the eye of a needle. It's not talking about the little gate and crawling through. That's a nice illustration, but what he's trying to illustrate is impossibility. And he said it's impossible for a rich person in their condition that the rich find themselves to go to heaven. Now, why would he say that? Why would it be hard for rich people to go to heaven? Because we tend to hold on tightly to our possessions. Do you remember the man that came running to Jesus? He says, good Good master, what must I do to have eternal life? I mean, what a per how would you like to go witnessing? You know, I, I say take track and share the gospel. How would you like people running to you and saying, hey, tell me how to be saved? And Jesus said, oh, you know the commandments. And the man says, oh, I've done all that. Jesus said, okay. Go sell all of your possessions. Instantly, it says the man's face fell. He turned and walked away. And you know what the postscript is? He had great or vast piled up stuff. You see, his treasures were supreme over any desire for God or Christ, and he could not submit his treasures to Christ. Do you see why the rich can't be saved? Jesus said, a saved person submits every appetite, every possession, everything in their life to me. Now, it doesn't instantly happen, but the repentance means a change in my mind that leads to that change in behavior. That I value Christ more supremely than anything else. And this man says, no, my treasures are more important. He walked away. Riches make it hard to get to heaven. We have more things per person than any nation has ever had in history. We're the winners. Remember what the last few days have told us? Our closets are full. Our storage space is used up. In fact, many people's cars cannot fit into their garages because the garages are overflowing because of the stuff. And we live in a society where our possessions first imprison us by the debt for them, then our possessions take over our houses, and finally our stuff begins to occupy our time. I mean, we, we're just spending all of our time with our possessions. We have been conquered by our possessions, and whatever we own begins to own us. So what Jesus is saying is, why would you want more of that? Why would you want to add to the occupation of your life with more and more. Because Jesus said the care of things makes our hearts grow cold. Now, one more lesson. Look at Luke. Uh, go to the right. You're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 12. This is probably uh, the distillation of Christ's philosophy uh, about stuff. It's not, he said, get rid of stuff. 
he said, entrust your stuff to God's control. Be, your riches are under God's control. Didn't say no riches. He said riches under God's control. It's, it's Luke 12, starting verse 15. And I'll read this. And he said to them, Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness. Oh, wait a minute. Covetousness? That's the 10th commandment. Don't covet. That means don't long to have what someone else has and not like what you have. Did you know that? That's the underlying theme of every advertisement. You ever think about it? I mean, you watch a car ad. Does your car, you know, have the air that, that goes like that? Does your car have rubbed walnut with gold flecks in it? Well, then you need one, you know? You should covet that. And there's just the whole idea of advertisement is to make us dissatisfied with what we have and want new, better, or more. Jesus said, be, take heed and beware of covetousness. Remember the Japanese gypsies? They're going into the radiation zone and coming out and going in, and they don't realize every time they go in, it's dangerous, it's deadly. Look what Jesus said. It's deadly. What's deadly? The next phrase in verse 15, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. In fact, it doesn't consist in possessions at all. Because the possessions are, are uncertain and they can be taken away and stolen and eaten by moths and burned and, and rot. See, he says, don't measure your life materially. That's what everyone does, though. Don't you think the happiest people are the ones they have the most? Don't you, doesn't, isn't people sit around and wish they could be like someone else? He says, don't do that. It doesn't consist in the abundance of things that you possess. Now he tells this story. Look at verse 16. He spoke a parable to them. This is one of the 38. It's about money. Saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. So this guy was a good uh, agricultural uh, businessman, agribusiness. Verse 17, so he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have room, no room to store my crops? So he was also a good manager. I mean, he's anticipating the yield. He's anticipating the need. He's, he's looking to increase his storage space, his warehousing. Good stuff. Jesus doesn't condemn any of this so far. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. Boy, the Lord is into all that. He says, yes, everything should be decently in order. Don't leave your corn on the ground. Don't let your animals out in the winter. They'll die. You know, have everything stored and neatly and orderly. Now watch. And I will say, verse 19, to my soul. Verse 19 is when you see the danger here. Do you know who's missing in the conversation? God. This was all me. What am I going to do with my... I'm going to build bigger barns. You know what the Lord's saying? Be careful you don't barn, build your barns too big. Be careful. If you only talk to yourself, you're only saying, yeah, yeah, you need to get a little more. Soul, verse 19, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's kind of like the retirement program for the Western society. Get a big enough barn to put enough in so you have more than enough to make it to the end. That's the goal. And look what Jesus says. Verse 20, but God said to him, you're foolish. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you've provided for? You know, the more you have, the more you lose. The more you leave behind, the more it hurts to pull it out of your hand. But here's the, here's the lesson. The, the rest was a story. Verse 21. So is he who lays up treasure for himself. Nothing wrong with treasure. It's just who's it belong to. As long as I look on my time, my schedule, my clothes, my money, my job, my future, my goals, my plans, my, 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 me, 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 I, I, I. That's laying up. We just lay up. Our, everything is, is around us. It's kind of like it's all about us and is not rich toward God. That's Jesus' philosophy. He didn't say don't have anything. He said, whose is it? And you know what the communion of Christmas that we're going to celebrate this morning is all about? Whose is it? In their state of being rich, the people, let's go back to close in Revelation 3, verse 18. We were in 17. Look what Jesus tells them in verse 18. This is the fourth habit Christ desires. 
Remember, we've been looking at these habits. Well, the fourth habit is in verse 18, and Jesus wants us to repent of spiritual wastefulness. What is spiritual wastefulness? Well, look what, look what he says. I counsel you. These people who, who are piling up all this stuff, he says, you know what? I would like to counsel you about what all that stuff is for in your life. Spiritual wastefulness is when we abandon Christ as our investment counselor. Look at the verse 18. I counsel you. Spiritual wastefulness is when we think that we're responsible for the disposition of our greatest treasure, that's our time, and, and all the other treasures we get in life. And we think it's ours. And it's all about my plans. Spiritual wastefulness is when we start investing our time and money for things that are going to perish on earth and not for things that will last forever in heaven. We begin to measure our life by their earthly value, not what they are in God's sight. Slowly we begin to trade our precious time that we have been given by God for objects, objects that will only rust, burn, rot, or get stolen. Or finally, death will pry them out of our hands, you know, either with our will or, you know, with the government's help in the courts. But we hold on to them. The bank of heaven and our regular deposits to the bank of heaven is neglected. And we funnel everything that God gives us. You know, everything good in our life comes down from above. And what we're supposed to do is take and say, wow, God, that's yours, and I just want to give it right back to you. But instead of that, we go, whoa, and we bury it, just like in another one of Jesus' parables. Spiritual wastefulness is when we ignore the clear words of Christ. Do you know what I didn't read to you? I didn't read earlier in chapter 6. I'll read it to you now. This is what Jesus said, 619 of Matthew. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. He says, don't stack your stuff that's really important to you on earth. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But I command you, verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We don't have moths, we don't have rust, there are no thieves to break in and steal. Why? Why should we do this heavenly layup? Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And Jesus said there, there are two places. Either our heart can be affixed here, and this is where our treasures are. And for us, if our treasures are here, death is a loss because we're going to lose all of our stuff. But if we're like Paul, he said, my citizenship is in heaven. And, and I am awaiting, my treasures are with the one I love, and I've given everything valuable back to him. He can do whatever he wants to with it because I gave it to him. Then death for us is gain. The eternal dangers of stuff, if we primarily store our treasures here on earth, we live our lives with what's most important going behind us, not ahead of us. Jesus told us our view of stuff is the reference point for our life. There's a profound lesson in the 55-year-ago martyrdom of Jim Elliot. Do you remember his famous statement, you know, the Aka Indian in Quito, in the Orinoco River that was killed by the Akas, Jim Elliot and the other four? He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. You understand what happened to Elliot? He, the great thing about Jim Elliot was not, was not made on that riverbank. It was made back in high school when he came to this consecration that all of his athletic abilities, his mental abilities, his, his incredible uh, personality got packed in that little package, that, that the goal of his life was not to surround himself with whatever he wanted, but surrender everything back to the Lord, even his life. And he says, you're not a fool if you give back to the Lord what you can't keep anyway, because when you give it back to the Lord, what you get back, you'll never lose. Jesus asked us this morning, as we celebrate communion, would you take some time to surrender everything you can't hold on to back to me? And to ask yourself, to ask myself, where does Jesus fit in my acquisition of stuff? What is my testimony in this world this Christmas? That we're living for stuff, that, that we're going to get more stuff. We're going to get rid of some of the stuff to replace it with more stuff that is going to be tossed aside at very quick time. That's why there's a new company, good news, that's renting Christmas toys. 
because kids don't like them two weeks later. They're just going to rent them. You can return them. Just pay the rent. Are we going to keep feeding that, Jesus said, or are we going to surrender back to him? Let's bow for a word of prayer. And with heads bowed, let's ask the Lord, Lord, will you change my heart's desire to only wanting stuff that will reflect your ownership? And Lord, will you be my investment counselor? And as the men prepare to serve us communion, let's ask the Lord. Father in heaven, I pray that as we hold in our hands a tangible reminder that you gave everything, your very life, you poured out your blood to purchase us so that we would not be our own anymore. And this morning, to any degree that we think that we are our own, that we determine everything, we own this stuff, it's ours, our time, our money, our schedule is ours. I pray that we would say at this communion, Lord, I repent of that wrong view of myself, my treasures, my time. I'm not my own. I present myself back to you. And may we, as we hold this bread and sing this hymn of consecration, may it be the beginning of the greatest gift we could give you this Christmas, which is giving ourselves back to your ownership and control, willingly as our spiritual sacrifice. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.